Hi, welcome back to McClatchy Maths. My name is Natalie McClatchy and today I'm taking you through the short response questions on decision mathematics in the 2011 external exams for Queensland in general mathematics. Let's go straight into our very first question. It was question 19 worth five marks and we're given an activity table for a project. There's some different activities here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G and H. Some of those have prerequisite activities and they all have different durations in days. We've been asked to use this table to construct a network diagram, including our earliest and latest starting times. That means we need to build the diagram and then forward and backward scan. So let's start with our first activities that don't have a prerequisite. That's activities A and B. We always start with a circle at the very beginning to show the start of the entire project. And then branching out of there, we have our activities A and B. And we actually write on the edges the name of the activity and its duration. When the activity finishes, we draw some new vertices in. So we've got started there with activity A and activity B. Now our next activity is activity C. As we can see in the table here, its prerequisite activity is activity A. So it needs to come out of the vertex that ends activity A. Then if we're going to move down as well, we're going to have a look at this um, one down here, activity D. So I always like to sort of progress down my table, but also looking at where in the diagram I'm going to draw these things. D comes out of its prerequisite activity of B. So far, so good. We need to end activity C and D with a vertex. But what we're going to do here is move activity E up towards C. Now sometimes when you're drawing these, you might be drawing them in a linear way. And then as you get through the project, you realize you need to actually diverge here. What I can see is going to happen if I look ahead in my activity table is that activity F is going to come out of C and E. Well, I've already drawn C. So I'm going to bring E up towards so that I can branch F out from there. F is four days in duration. Now if I look further down in my table, I can see that activity G needs to come out of activity D. Here's activity D. So it's gonna branch out from here. And then both of those activities are gonna to join together here and with a final vertex where activity H has F and G as its prerequisite. And then we finish our diagram entirely with another vertex at the end to indicate that the project is complete. Now to backward and forward scan through the network, I need to actually um, divide each of these circles in half. And that's why it's a good idea to make sure you draw your circles big enough at the beginning so that you can actually write in them. Now, if I've actually correctly drawn this network diagram, I've earned my first of five marks. So um, not too hard, you just need to be able to translate a table into a network diagram. Now we're going to also get another mark here for these labels. So it's important that we make sure we've got the activity letter and the duration. If you'd left the duration off, you wouldn't have achieved that mark. And you need that duration to forward and backward scan through your network. So it's important to write that. A lot of people make the mistake of drawing the activity and the duration in the vertex. Remember with these kinds of diagrams, it's always drawn on the edge. So now we're putting those little lines down the center. It could also be done um, horizontally some textbooks show it in that way as well um, it's not right or wrong way as long as you know what you're doing and you're actually calculating your earliest and latest start times correctly so we're going to start at the far left hand side here and it always starts at time zero and then we move forward through the network well following along the pathway of a I'm going to add two days and that goes into the left hand side of that vertex now I'm not going to keep moving along that pathway because as you can see my next vertex has two pathways coming in. So I need to make a decision at that point. I can't make that decision until these vertices are filled out first. So let's go along the bottom pathway now. With B, we're going to add 4. And then with D, we're going to add 6 plus 4 gives us 10. So now we're at this decision point. At the decision point, I need to work out whether I'm going to put 5 in there, 2 plus 3, or will I put 13 in there? And you'll recall that you have to put the biggest one in when you're moving forward, because if I was to put five in there, what that indicates is that the project's gonna keep on going, but it can't until E's finished. So that means that E will be incomplete, and we're moving forward with this incomplete part of the project, which means the project won't work, because F can't start till E's done. So that means we're gonna add the largest one through, that'll become 13 in that vertex. Now we can keep moving forward in the network. 
we've got another choice again. Do I add 10 plus 8, which would be 18, or 13 plus 4, which is 17? As I said before, we need to put the largest one in there. Then we can finish the project on 22 days. So we forward scan. These are our earliest start times. Now we need to backwards scan through the network. So the last vertex has the same number in it twice. And now we simply move backwards. Well, the first one's pretty straightforward. We take four away from 22, we get 18. Now we need to go and go through different pathways in the network. Now, if you go into the um, vertex here, it's only got one um, path coming back into that one. Whereas these ones got arrowheads going in. So I can actually move backwards there pretty easily. And it's a straightforward 18 takeaway, 4 gives 14. If I move backward here, you can see you've got 2 coming back. And that means a decision point. So it's actually easier just to keep moving along the pathways where there's only one um, choice. So now I'm going to move back that pathway along C. 13 takeaway, 3 gives me 10. So now I've filled across the whole top of that first pathway. So now I'm going to need to come back and backwards scan through here. And here I've got some choices. Coming down this pathway here, I'm either going to have 14 takeaway 3, which is 11, or 18 takeaway 8, which is 10. So I've got a choice of 11 or 10 to put into this vertex here. Now, when we're going backwards through the network, we actually choose the lowest option. So forward, highest, backwards, lowest. So that would give us 10. Then we've got only one choice going backwards. That gives us a four. And then, of course, at our starting point, we have our second zero there. So now we have forward and backwards scanned through the network. And evidence of that was our third mark. Now we're on to path B. We have to determine the critical path. This is the pathway through the network that takes the longest to get everything done. And the reason why it's the critical path is that anything that falls off the wayside on that pathway will make the whole project blow out or take longer than it should. Now the way to correctly identify your critical pathway is to look for the vertices where the number is the same on the left and the right hand side. So we can see that's our bottom pathway here. Now, when you're actually determining the critical path, you actually need to, to write down the letters of that pathway. It's going to be B, D, G, and H. So um, then that's our critical path that earned us our fourth mark. All right, now we need to determine the shortest completion time for the project. What is the shortest that this project can be done in? Well, that's very simple. We look at our last vertex and that gives us 22. So we need to make sure we give our answer as a statement and we look at the duration, it's days. So the shortest that we can actually finish this whole project is in 22 days. That was our fifth mark. Okay, our next question on the paper for short answer questions on decision mathematics is a minimum flow maximum cut question. So the network diagram shows the flow of water from the tank over here on the left. It's usually drawn on the left and that's our source all the way to the kitchen tap, which is our sink. So you need to think about source and sink. Usually we draw the source on the left and the sink on the right, but not always. So just be aware of that. Make a logical sense. The stuff that comes out of our taps, that pours out, it comes from a tank. So that's our source, where it comes from. Okay, so we need to explain which dashed line is not a valid cut. So we've got four lines cutting through the network here and one of those is not going to be valid. We need to explain why. Well, you recall that if for a valid cut to be taking place, it must completely cut the source off from the sink. They must be completely separated from one another, which means flow is not going to be able to pass through the network from the beginning to the end. So let's have a look at line one. Well, line one, it's a valid cut. It actually cuts off all of the lines coming out of the source. So no flow will go past that point. So it's valid. Let's look at L2. L2 also cuts everything off in the whole network. It is also a valid cut. All flow is cut through the network. It's just cut later on. L3 is also a valid cut. It cuts through all of the lines in the network. Nothing can pass through at that point. So that leaves us with L4. Now L4 is not valid because if we look at this cut here, we've got the tank and the tap on the same side of this cut. So we're actually going to have flow traveling through a number of places. You can see here that with L4, 
we're going to get all this flow coming through and it still gets through to the tap from all those pathways that are not cut. So that's why it's not valid. All you needed to do to earn the mark in this question was to say it's not valid because the source and the sink are on the same side of the cut and flow can travel through. So that's recognising they're on the same side, not on opposite sides, is your mark achievement there. Part B now wants us to calculate the capacity of each cut. That is a valid cut. There are three valid cuts, if you remember. They were L1, L2 and L3. And we get a mark for each of those capacity calculations. So what we do to calculate the capacity is we're actually going to calculate the numbers of all of these flow lines that pass through that dot to dot. So we're going to add a 20, a 22 and a 15. And that will give us a total capacity of that cut of 57. Let's look now at cut L2. So once again, we're going to count all of the lines it passes through moving from the direction of tank to tap. We've got an 18, we've got a 19, we've got a 22. We're not going to count the 16 because it's going backwards from tap to tank. And we've also got this 15 here as well. So that will give us a total capacity of 74. Our last cut that we need for our final mark on this question is passing through 18, 8, and then down here a 10. So that's going to give us a total capacity of 36. Well, that's all we have time for today. And they're the only questions that were in this particular paper on, that were short response questions on decision mathematics. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, why not tell someone? Why not like and subscribe and hit the notification so you'll know when our next video is hitting the screens. And if you've got any questions at all about anything you saw today, please email us at mcclutchymass at yahoo.com or direct messages on Facebook and Instagram. We're on social media. Why not join us there as well? Well, thank you so much for watching today. I'm Natalie McClutchy and you've been watching McClutchy Maths. Have a wonderful day.